You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. I'm Matt Garrisonovich, PhD candidate at Northwestern University studying Russian literature and film. And I'm Cameron Lalana, literature enthusiast and a guy working in media. This is the podcast for people who want to learn more about Slavic literature, art, and culture. Every episode, we're going to be bringing you the background and analysis you'll need to know to understand these works. If you're interested in supporting us, you can head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. All right, Matt, what are we covering this week? This week, we're going to be covering the short story in Out of Tune Piano in Accordion by Sofia Andruhovich. It's an entry in the Ukrainian literature series anthology called The White Chalk of Days. Uh, yes, and this one this will be an interesting one. This is a, a fairly recent piece. Um, I don't know the exact. I don't know its original publication, but it was within the last ten years. Uh, it was published in this anthology in 2017 in English, at least. My my only problem with this anthology is a is a mental barrier that I've created for myself, where I keep wanting to call it the white chalk, or right. sorry, the the the. the the you got day, it. What the? What did I? I know. I said it wrong last time. I've been saying it wrong in my head for like all week. Like the white days of chalk, and I like can't I can't get the word straight. Right. The White Days of Chalk so well. does, it's a good title, I think. That'd be, that sounds like an action novel. I, I like a, I don't know, late 90s kind of thing. Maybe it'll be like their follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> it's the follow-up literature. This one is poetry talking about, you know, the various forms of Ukrainian art, followed up by like exclusively hard, you know, hard-boiled new noir pieces. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm taking solace in knowing that this part of the podcast is being cut. <laughs> <laughs> you hope. I hope. <laughs> um, so no, okay. this one is available freely online. I double checked through the the anthology has a website, and it's really wonderful. And if you like it, there's a lot of other books by this author. And you can find that website in the show notes. Yeah. So Sofia Andrukovich, current modern author. Uh, we won't be going over a ton of background in this one, since there isn't as much with uh, with modern authors as there is with, with authors who have uh, had their time and had people look back and write biographies about them. Um, but still writing, still winning awards. On, uh, Andrukovich is a, is a translator, translates works into, into Ukrainian, as well as writing her own works, which are translated out, which must be a fascinating thing to look at languages that you translate from into your own native language your own works being translated back into that um i wonder what the experience of looking at that is like and wonder um if you ever if you ever you think she ever like looks at me like i don't know if i intended that or if the fact that she does do that in reverse makes it actually uh the translations might be much more uh robust because of that based on an interview we found with the translator it sounds like he had um the translator vitaly chernetsk had some contact with her through this process i don't think i'd be able to look if i was a writer and i saw my stuff being translated into other languages that i knew i feel like i would be like too particular <laughs> i would have to like stop myself right right that's fair So i could understand that <laughs> right <laughs> that's fair um so yeah you'll there's not a whole lot to say about her on the whole unless there's anything in particular you want to bring up matt i did have a few uh, awards maybe people might be interested in and but you know like you said she was born in 1982, so she's not dead, not even close. So there is not as much written about her. This is one of the few authors that we've covered that is still alive, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> it's part of a series, I think, that we're kind of internally calling authors you should be familiar with or short stories you should be reading. Um, and so these are. this is an example of a short story that we think is, is very good, deserves more attention, and we, we hope to play our little part in uh, in bringing this to our audience. But yes, like you said, Cameron, she's author, an author, a translator. She's also the daughter of Yuri Andrehovich, who is an author and a translator as well. So that's convenient. Um, in 2014, this is, I think, her most popular novel, from what I could tell, Felix Austria. It won the BBC Ukrainian's Book of the Year Award. And then there was a Ukrainian-Polish feature film released in 2020 that was based on it. Then in March 2021, she received the Women in Arts Award in Literature. So pretty pretty well decorated, I would say, so far. And then, like we said, this was a short story that was included in this collection that we're kind of reading from. Good collection. Only problem for us was that there's, there's a lot more poetry than prose, which is uh, tougher for our format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, at least we've got this. Yeah. And um, before we get into the story, we'll briefly recap it. And this one will truly be a very brief recap, not only Mm -hmm. because it's a short story, but because there's not a lot of actual movement in this piece. And it's also, yeah, it's really short. I think it was like 10 pages. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. But basically, we we start off with the story and it's in the most bare bones way to, to explain this. There are, there's a lot of, I will say, kind of flowery language. I know that kind of sounds a little derisive, but I mean that in a way that it's, there's a lot of description which doesn't relate necessarily, necessarily relate to the, the goings on in a literal sense. Uh, so I'll just, we'll go over that later. But this is about a story about two characters, um, about Renat and about Viola. Renat is an, is an older man who has been quite wealthy through most of his life. Sounds like he's been on some sort of I don't know, high powered business kind of stuff. He's 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 been living on champagne and yachts his whole life. And at the ripe old age of sixty, with what, the two or three kids, three or four grandkids, um, after being married to the same woman through his whole life, he meets this woman Viola, who is younger, uh, attractive. She's not really polished in a social sense in the way that he is, uh, but that seems to be something that draws him to her. And so he leaves his wife, he he joins with her. And um, this particular story opens up on her, like uh, the viola kind of sitting in a chair, you know, drenched, and um, we're not throwing a blanket over her. And we follow through, you know, how they met, going back to, okay, he leaves his wife, he joins with her, their life that they were mostly living in this little uh, dacha, which... um, Renat got through the divorce, um, how Viola kind of makes herself at home, tries to become a, you know, high class social person uh, in training, how she maintains this garden. And ultimately, in one particular day, sort of has an argument with Renat or not so much an argument, but rather she fears for him in a way that he kind of is like, oh, just please stop bothering me, which leads her to that night after he goes to bed to wander out into the forest and kind of come across this um, in a, this abandoned building, a, a musical scene, event, a woman who's never seen really from the front uh, playing a piano, mu- other music, a dance, a crowd of shades around them, and ultimately a, a story or like a dance, which is only interrupted by her, her cat, Methodius. And at that point, she goes back home and um, Renat finds her sitting out in the yard and takes her back inside and puts that blanket back on her at the beginning of the story, which... Um, that's that's the story in brief. That's the story in brief. But of course, the devil is in the details in terms of what we're talking about here. Uh, Matt, is there anywhere in particular that you wanted to start? Because I know this one was uh, this is an interesting one because we're there's no at least as far as we can find in English no scholarship on this one. So we're going into this mostly on our own interpretations, which is a little different than usual. No, not my own thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I think. I'm still a little confused by it, I'm going to be completely honest. And I feel like there is something that I'm scratching at that I'm still missing mm. in terms of my analysis, and it's bothering me. It's really bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I feel like I have... I, I'm, like, almost there on the story. Sure. And that's kind of how the whole story feels while you're reading it. And I've read it, like, multiple times now. Because, like I said, it's, it's, it's short. And I, I've gone back, and I've noticed new things each time. I still feel I feel uh, stuck by this dream trance scene. I feel like there's some like uh, folklore aspect that I'm missing to this. That someone listening to this is probably like, "Oh, you idiot! It's you know this." And I feel like I, there's something like that that I'm that I'm missing. Right. Yeah, I, I understand that. I do do feel, especially when we get to this particular kind of dreamlike, you know, this dance and this abandoned building. It does feel like I, I had that same thought. Of like I feel like I'm missing some cultural touchstones here. Hmm which may make this make more sense or even possibly I'm just looking for things that maybe aren't even cultural touchstones. You know, as I, as I was describing it, it sounded less, you know, like, I don't know. It sounded like some sort of dance macabre I've seen in many other forms of literature across time, you know, the shades around them, almost like kind of like a Hades, uh, I don't know, scene from a scene from Hades or Greek mythology. I, yeah, I'm stuck between that, those two. Am I missing something here in terms of, uh, a cultural touchstone or am i looking for something that's not actually there and that's preventing me from like really just taking on a, on its own on its own bearing i guess i also thought that it was a dream for what it's worth this is just my this was just my reading this whole uh this whole scene where where she leaves and um i've, I've been i, I noticed this is my, my second time going back kind of the way that the logic 
of the piece works. I notice these just like little bits and pieces that are sort of subtly buried in parts of the paragraph that seem to indicate something going forward. But like you mentioned, it's really difficult to find these because the language is incredibly ornamental. Mm -hmm. And right, not in a derisive way, in a way that it's like reading s sort of uh, free verse poetry is what this feels like uh, a, a lot of times. There's this, there's this line in the second paragraph where she describes a skeptical grimace as a, a puffed lower lip like a moist cherry. And there's just a lot, a lot of things like that where, like, you know, they don't, they don't need to be described in, in such ways, but, but they are. Like the pine trees swinging like pendulums. Like there's some really beautiful imagery in here. And it does at times border on ornamental. But it sort of, for me, <laughs> made it difficult to try to nail down what I'm supposed to be looking for. Mm. But so this this whole dream theory that I have, there's this whole section about her tending to the tomatoes, right? After she gets married and she's trying to garden. And then there is this second part about Methodius the cat, about how he's just this uh, free spirit cat. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he goes around to the, the neighboring houses and he's basically eating people's vegetables and pooping in the gardens. And I thought maybe that the... I thought maybe Viola was upset by this. Because this is the thing, is Renat finds her waking up next to the cat. And, and what I'm wondering is if in this drunken stupor, because she's described as being an alcoholic, like, did she do this to the cat? You know, that's what I'm still stuck on. <laughs> well, at the, end of the, at the end of the dream, it's the cat that saves her from this kind of, you know, I don't know if I would call it a dance of death, but certainly... It's this this kind of she's she's forced into a dance by this bony, bloodless youth with an unnaturally long face, and he like grabs her with you know strong fingers, which is compared directly to she's there's a kidnapping attempt described earlier mm -hmm. in the in the story, mm -hmm. and it's it's he's it's described as like his grip is stronger than that kidnapping attempt, which feels like a you know the grip of death, and then it's the Methodius isn't named, but there's like this little cat creature who you know jumps in and claws pull her back out, which you know could be to the dream, uh, uh, to your to your point about you know dream logic you know a black cat protects is a protector of sorts um i i think if i i'll, I'll, I'll put my all my hands on the table here i i think i might be reading this with maybe a too straightforward interpretation i i, I just look at this as sort of a a way of dealing with sorry speaking of cats i've got i've got a cat right here who's deciding that she really wants to rubber face in the microphone let me have to put her you out you said the word cat too many times <laughs> I spoke of a black cat being summoned, and uh, the black cat of this house decided that she was her time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think I, maybe I, I'm not looking deeply enough into this, but when I'm looking at this, it just feels like dealing with death, with fears around death. Although I will say, I the death is Renat's to, to suffer, to die from. So the one place my I would say my understanding does fall apart is why is Viola the one encountering... I think this, I, I, the dream, the, the dance, real or unreal, whatever it is, that one, that's where it does fall apart, I will say, that she's the one who's encountering that and is saved by the cat, uh, and not Renat. So, that's, that, that is my one hang-up with how I read this story. There are a lot of hang-ups that I have with this story that I can't quite figure out. Sure. Because I guess we should start by the, the sort of general setting, where... She talks about the wandering ghost camp that's right. in the forest that's here. And, you know, you can believe it or not, but it's here. <laughs> right. And so I, I didn't know what to make out of the wandering ghost camp. Uh, for a long time, I, I had multiple interpretations. Is it swarms of mosquitoes? Yeah, that's described pretty prevalently in a way that you could describe a ghost. Is it the tourists that are coming to this kind of uh, more remote area? That are described. I don't know. And then I, I see the kind of uh, d difference between, to answer your question, Renat and Viola based on... Renat is just kind of this like materialist user, basically. Mm -hmm. If you're living on yachts in like the Soviet Union, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know exactly when this is set, but presumably if he was, you know, around during this time, this is not exactly how people descri uh, describe living in the, so in the Soviet Union, right? Right. Uh, and so, I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, this is one of the ones where I feel like I'm being a little overly prescriptivist in my understanding where, okay, this is about death. Because when I read The Ghost Camp, I'm like, okay, well, this is, uh, I don't know, like the wandering of death near and far. Because, you know, you can, you know, you can believe in it or not, like you mentioned earlier with this, when you're describing the the interesting ways that Andrukovic uh, describes doubt in the face. Um, but it's, you know, the this ghost camp is something that's only of the night. It's something that, you know, the mosquito swarm. The night exha- exhales the first mosquito swarms, open its, opens its jaws full of warm muck, a coarse crone with a jelly-like body, nearly blind and hopelessly so witted. Just think what its drunken grin and cloudless joys are worth. Uh, it's a very negative imagery for most of the night, it mm-hmm. describes, which is only, it's not it's not sent away at dawn, but it quiets down at dawn. It quiet down, quiets down only at dawn when the contours of trees slowly become clearer, birds shake their wings and clear their throats, and so on and such forth. And uh, this isn't an especially literary analysis, but it does feel like I don't know. How, I don't know how often you're in the you're in the habit of just like staying up all night and just watching the dawn, which I I confess I haven't done in many years. But you know, if you're you know, when I was like a teenager and you have no other form of fun other than just like literally walking around, and sometimes you like happen to walk around all night and in your town until dawn. I don't know if that's a relatable thing. Um, there is like this sense of just unreality, which pervade. It's really just pervades everything at night walking around like that is which is like in my experience literally dispelled by the coming of the dawn that sort of unreality goes away uh which is maybe a little too literal for (laughs) for this but looking at this idea of this ghost camp which this sort of unreality this like the the idea of normal life almost breaking down at night like being put on hold um i mean that's what i look at that as like this kind of the weakening of the barrier between what we perceive as our daily lives the normal life and um you know, the, the things that are not normal, death or, you know, encounters of something else, uh, which is not rebuffed, not sent away by Don, but only quieted. Mm-hmm. It's always there. Just, you know, you can ignore it. Yeah, I don't know. This still felt like uh, I'm still kind of on dream analysis here. Sure. Because the way that you mentioned the kidnapping scene, mm. th- this is kind of how I feel like the story works. Like something is placed and then it's sort of acted upon and so this image of the kidnapping scene is in her memory and she's thinking about it and then when she drinks so much that she passes out it sort of plays out in her head but in the sort of like <laughs> mystical fantastical scene right it's not the it's it's not it doesn't have the sort of exoticism it doesn't have uh you know any of the the reality right it's it's people without faces and and shadows and things and so it kind of the there's the sort of uh a little bit derisive uh, line that the narrator spices in the second to last laughed it's gracious <laughs> in the second to last paragraph here where it says viola looks for miracles at the bottom of a greenish bottle and i kind of i kind of <laughs> You know, feel like it's. I, I don't know where it ultimately comes down. I guess is what I'm saying because clearly you're not really supposed to be rooting for Renat because, he, you know, he he is sure. what he is, and Viola is sort of seems to me the sort of like a little more spiritual, but also uh, the terrible alcoholic. You know, I, I I don't know if I agree with the characterization that like you're not supposed to root for him. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know if you're supposed to root for anyone, but I but I've been thinking. We talked about mentioned that the translator did an interview earlier, mm-hmm. and uh, something that he he says about her is that uh, that she that she uh, Sophie Andru narrator or the uh, Andrukovic herself um, she's she writes about people she observes people um, he says that she was inspired by people she kind of saw or, or viewed when she moved to a touristic area of, of uh, Kiev. Um, and people who are quirky, perhaps damaged, or not normative on the mental health spectrum, but she's loving to her, towards her characters. And I think that's, looking at them, they're both, <laughs> Renat and Viola are both people who are troubled in their own ways. Uh, yes. But it is a very tender, uh, it's it's a very tender treatment of both of them for all of their failings. The the the, the dance macabre, the soul, that old dream scene, perhaps, is driven by, you know, them arguing over Renat's death. But other than that, I mean, they have a very tender relationship. It ends on, you know, we're not finding her outside in the yard um, and taking her in and, and putting a blanket over. And all three of them, you know, sitting there quietly uh, and, and um, 
were not telling her, you know, the argument was basically over him kind of not accepting that he would die or really not <laughs> not comforting Viola over that. He's getting old. Uh, but at the very end, he kind of and I, I don't know how to read this exactly, but he kind of tells her, you know, we'll never we'll never, ever be apart. Now, however, you want to read that as a, a comforting lie, as a lie telling her, as a lie telling to himself. I don't know, as a statement that whatever they have will transcend his death. I don't know how to read that exactly. That's something that I'm still struggling with, especially because immediately follows that with whispering to himself, it'll it'll be time soon, kids, which feels like a him talking about something inevitable, something that he can't control, presumably his death. Um, you know, up to this point, he's been described as uh, um, he's older. He is fallen apart a little bit. He won't he will not get treated for any of it. He won't even get dentures for his teeth, which are falling out because he feels that things should rot. Um, and, you know, when he goes out to look for Viola, he's described as a diseased predator, an old diseased predator. So he, he sees like falling apart at the seams. Yeah, he's not looking too hot. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. That's how I read not not maybe sympathetic people, but people who are treated with a, a lot of kindness in spite, despite or for them, I guess. Mm -hmm. No, that's fair. I have this part that I don't know. Um, maybe it's my own my own personal inclination i feel like there is like this permeating sense of the natural world that is being stripped away or stamped out by the sort of mechanical world mm. and there's this line that and again the way it works here is a really masterful way of shifting perspectives in the story like, who's actually talking and perceiving is very rarely clear. Um, it's really interesting the way that it kind of bops back and forth. And this one must be from from Viola's point of view, but Methodius, uh, he, he stretches and then he purrs, basically. And the narrator says, This was like the purr of the granulators, agglomerators, and shredders made by Burlington, the <laughs> Japanese company whose sales rep Renat was. Just one capsulator sale and a trip to Sri Lanka is guaranteed. And so, for one thing, formally, Andrahovic in this story, she puts other people's perspectives in parentheses. That happens most of the time that we have parentheses. Where she'll put dialogue from the past or, like, thoughts from the past that belong to other people. Uh, she does this with Renat describing Viola, for instance. And here this is the... You know, this is either something Renat had said to her many times or something that the... The sales rep was selling Renat on, right? But just the fact that a simple purring of a cat immediately triggers this association with machinery and the setting of the story being in somewhere which was or is or like has this sort of rural, at times folkloric charm, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's some sort of something being destroyed by it. And that's why I felt like Renat wasn't like not the one to be rooting for. Maybe is not the best way to describe it. But that's where I felt like there was some tension on that right that that is interesting it is interesting isn't it that's what i thought too <laughs> um <laughs> it's not yeah i don't know it's it's not a piece that's just so one-sided it's very easy to analyze that's what i really like about it yeah i like that too i think i'll also maybe i don't know if this is a corollary to what you're talking about but also the way uh in which nature itself becomes inverted for the scene for most mm -hmm. of the of this piece uh the garden is a sign of life it's something it's a kind of a focal point for viola growing where she grows things where she decorates um but i also thought it was interesting when she's going into this this dream she enters through she walks out into the forest and she finds this abandoned building and as she walks in uh the the very first thing we note about to basically describe how it's the building itself is abandoned other than literally saying that it was you know like filled with the stuffy moisture it talks about the plant life in there the the um the things growing through the cracks in the floors and the walls, mm -hmm. the plants breaking through, the little twisted pines, ferns, lichens, and puddles of stinky brownish water. Um, I think that that's kind of interesting. That now, what was a scene ago a sign of life, yeah, you know, the same thing exact, pretty much. Plant life is now a sign of of death in a sense, or maybe a, a abandonment, really. Um, and that that symbols of life can be so inverted or represent such different things depending on their their context which isn't maybe an especially interesting thing to say but uh, to your point about how these i don't know these things get kind of played with these ideas get played with throughout the story mm -hmm. did you think about war at all in relation to this destruction like in the in this cabin i i did not think about war 
I did not. It felt it mm. felt like a to the extent that the the hallway or the the abandoned building it, it you know it felt much like any given town especially smaller towns more rural areas uh which maybe have not had a lot of economic opportunity for a while just have all these kind of dilapidated yeah. buildings and no it felt very normal but uh, um yeah yeah let me let me throw that back over to you because i think i think i understand where you're going yeah a little bit probably i can't remember what exactly it was when i was reading through but there were some maybe the splintering of the floor the large gaps in the floor i thought like it seemed like a particularly destructive force but it could just be the force of time and i I wanted to not completely read it with that uh with that lens just because i feel like especially given the context of russia's invasion of ukraine we tend to read everything through that lens because it's so you know pervasive and i feel like almost at times we just we fetishize war just so much. And like, if something artistic comes out of Ukraine, like it has to be linked to war. And in some ways it is great that attention is still being drawn to that. However, I do think it can diminish really the, uh, the art of people who are not talking about it or who are talking about it in a way that like doesn't fit whatever narrative we're trying to fit. Right. Mm hmm. And so this is just my like the small personal gripe that being on Twitter has you know made me develop. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's right. just a gripe about Twitter. Uh, That's fair, as everything is. Um, but yeah, so I, I had the thought that I was like May- maybe, but then I was like no, probably probably not. I mean, you could maybe, but I shouldn't. And that was my internal monologue. That's fair. <laughs> uh, well, related to that, we talked a little bit about this before, but there is this interview that the author Andrew Hovich, um gives in um i think it's i don't know if this was it was with pen ukraine so this happens uh this is an interview she gives and what i thought was interesting was it's mostly mostly an interview about like what the beginning of the war was like for her very little about her actual work which uh is is interesting um but towards the end she says this which uh i think is very interesting in relation to what you've just said the huge interest in ukraine brought by the full-scale invasion is very important Everyone who has some kind of influence should try and learn more about us. To translate Ukrainian authors, to find more about our history, to understand us better. The main thing is that we are noticed now. I hope this interest will only grow in the future. And at risk of putting our, what we just said, into her words, uh, I mean, I think that's this is just adding on to the importance of when something becomes very noticed by the public, it, it tends, everything tends to be understood through that particular lens especially if it's you know a country who and this is very typical of uh, i guess news cycles in general a lot of countries are not necessarily within uh western or american understandings until something major happens there and then everything following like you've said matt becomes interpreted through that particular lens of that event Mm -hmm. and i think to to again to your point uh i think i think it's a good thing that people are paying attention to to ukraine uh, but also, Ukraine is not the war. Ukraine is experiencing the war. That's something it that sees every day. That is a very important thing to understand right now, today. Um, I wouldn't take away from that. But also, Ukraine as a country, as a people, has a lot more and has existed far beyond this. Um, as as is true with many other countries who really, frankly, don't get their due. Honestly, most of them, most cultural canons in the world... Uh, are, Actually, most countries come to think of it. Yeah, yeah, pretty. I mean, you know, there are so many countries which you probably you might only think about through the lens of conflict. I mean, even like I'm just, I was I just throw out a random example of like Yemen. You know, when was the last time you, you heard about Yemen? Not through the lens of talking about conflict there. And I'm I'm trying to remember. I think the last thing I think this was a Yemeni book was um it was like a thousand curses upon Dostoevsky or a curse upon Dostoevsky. Um, which is really, which is, is a retelling of crime and punishment, which is also very good. I'll put that in the show notes, but again, that also, even that was through the lens of, of warfare or the experience of warfare, which to be fair, very relevant to Yemen, but you know, in a broader sense, there, there are so many countries which maybe you only think about through warfare, which is this sort of, uh, it draws people in quite a bit, but anyway, sorry, I've, I've kind of gone off into the deep end with, with what you're talking about, but yeah, I, in short, I agree. Sorry, not the book's not in Afghan, not in Yemen. It's it's set in Afghanistan, so obviously not the same country. But also, when is the last time you tired or read a news article about Afghanistan that wasn't about war in some way? Yeah, I think the the danger also of that is that when 
hopefully there is no more war there, then the importance in the view of the public is that it's lessened, right? Okay, well, we don't have a war there. There's no more art about this war going on now. We no longer need to pay attention to the region, right? The region's only important insofar as I can study it based on, you know, my understanding of some sort of conflict, which is not good. Um, is not a good approach to literature always. Yeah. Ever, really. No. <laughs> and I think we, we, you know, we've always tried to get into that. I mean, I... I'll confess that, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of conflict has been an interest of mine. I mean, that's part of what my degree's in. But also, like, that's what we've tried to do with books, like um, with uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich is talking about, you know, World War II, about the experience not of, you know, the war, but of the people who ultimately all wars are made up of. They're, you can look at them as battle lines and tactics and supply lines and all this and that, but all those have an individual human story, which are worth telling as well if you're going to you know, be pursuing that particular subject, which, you know, there is worth in telling war stories, but maybe they should be, they should be directed or understood in a broader and, you know, as part of a broader understanding, but that's all I had to say on that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I don't want to beat it to death, but yeah, it was something that's been bothering me looking at Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been on Twitter just recently again for the podcast stuff. And I, and I hate every time <laughs> I'm there. Yeah. All right, I think this is a good time for a break. We'll be back in just a second. This episode is brought to you by us. You can support independent podcasting by heading over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. You'll get access to the notes we use to make this episode, which are extensive because we're really trying to wrap our heads around it. Uh, that includes all the links to the secondary sources, in this case, interviews that we mentioned. If you want to support the show but don't want to spend any of your hard-earned doubloons, you can join our email list for free at slaviclitpod.com, or you can leave us a nice review wherever you get your podcasts. Questions, comments, or maybe you want to appear on our Office Hours podcast? Drop us a line. You can reach our voicemail at 209-800-3944. That's 209-800-3944. Or you can also email us a voice recording or text question at slaviclitpod at gmail.com. We'll bring your question out of the podcast and do our best to address it. All right. Enough of us talking. Let's get back to us talking. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you want to go? Because I've got a couple things I've, I've got floating around in my mind, but they're smaller. The one thing that bothers me. Yes. The one that thing I, that, that bothers you. There's one thing that bothers me. Well, there's a lot of things that bother me. <laughs> sure. But in this case, there's one thing that bothers me. And of course, now that I go to look for it, I can't find it. So th this one singular thing that bothers me is that before she leaves to go to the forest, she, it says, grabs an uneven quadrangle of broken mirror. Mm. Why? <laughs> this is why I feel like she accidentally killed the cat in her drunken stupor. <laughs> I don't think, is the cat dead? You know what I mean? No, it's not dead, but there's this whole thing where it was injured previously. Oh, yeah. And she's saying, that's pretty messed up. Only a human could have done that. And I think she did it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. It, it's not dead, but it's like, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty injured. Yeah. Is she terrorizing this cat accidentally? <laughs> These are the things that bother me. This is what's keeping me up at night. <laughs> I was laying in bed just stewing over this. Oh, do we need to call animal control on this on this uh, on this household? <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, something I find interesting related to the cat is how much the um, how much Renat refers to the cat Methodius and Viola as his kids. Um, mm -hmm. Because early on in the story, uh, it said when he's he's standing in the room with them. Oh, <laughs> Renat, how much did this sly old fox of a man love them? His kids. His short fingers dug into the edge of the table so that so that the tips hurt. This is how much he craved to stay just a bit longer here next to them. And at first, I interpreted that as like, like literally talking about his kids, which he has. Um, mm -hmm. But the only people in the room are Violet, Methodia, or Violet, Viola, and Methodius. And it, it wasn't until the very end of the story when he again addresses them. You know, tells them it'll come soon, kids. As Viola is sitting in a chair and uh, Methodius is sitting in her lap, kind of all stretched out. Um, when I was like, all right, I'm pretty certain he calls them his kids, which uh, I don't really have anything particular to say about that. Other, than, I mean, the fact that he calls them his kids, I don't know what to say about that. But, you know, he's, he's got this incredible drive to stay near them, which, again, I, I, not to beat a dead horse, but that's why I read this as like a story of dealing with death. And, you know, Viola is the one afraid of it. Maybe that's why she goes through this dream or this encounter, whatever it is. Well, Renat mostly deals with denial. You know, he's he's literally white knuckling a table so he can stand up just to stay closer to them um you know every day he, he says he feels like he's melting into the air so he's like grabbing on to what he can 
well, he well, he still has the time, and he's not really acknowledging it, but at some level, he seems to understand that he really can't, that his time is very limited. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know we mentioned that the story like literally conveys to you that he's basically falling apart, but I think maybe it's important to also mention that he seems very aware of that fact, which is partially what drives Viola away, that he won't comfort her over that, <laughs> over it. Which, I mean, fair enough. I mean, you know, it's your death. I, don't... I just think it's funny, like, that he does have actual kids and... Right, like they're not right. There's nothing about them. They're not relevant. Six, two kids and six grandkids. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and he's hanging out with his cat. Hanging, hanging out with his cat. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, going back to what the translator said, it's uh, Andrukovic takes interesting characters and treats them with a, a lot of of kindness in, in interrogating who they are in their quiet moments. Because I mean, in a different story, Renat could be. Renat could be interesting. He could be he could be a villain. He could be a Wolf of Wall Street character. When he's introduced beyond the point when it's talking about how much he's falling apart, it, he's described almost exclusively in terms of materials. He's described mm -hmm. in like a list of, you know, his life is made up of yachts and uh, champagne and traveling and Cuban women and, oh, I can't believe they eat this cheese. It's how expensive? Um, he, you know, and then it, she goes on to say that he's like an old Steinway piano uh, that uh, he's cracked on the outside, but of course on the inside, still a sine way. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, it's such an interesting way to describe a character exclusively through, I mean, like not, not even just consumption habits. It's not described as a, as a habit. It's just, it's who he is. He is material wealth in a way. <laughs> yeah, but so the, to me, that's why I think that um, Vela has a dream and he doesn't. Hmm. He doesn't have that dimension to him. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I agree with that. Although there is the um, sort of one one line that gave me pause towards the very end when he looks up at the trees and he's, he says that, or the narrator says, I think from his perspective, that the black treetops formed extravagant Baroque ornaments against the sky, mm. which is not really how I would uh, picture him viewing the world. Right. As giving much credence to the way that anything in nature looks. When the whole time he's described, right, piano, Rolls Royce, yachts, like, kind of awesome. Right. <laughs> I guess probably, you're probably not supposed to think that, but, like, kind of awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, like, an exciting life, clearly, up to this point. Yeah, yeah, it's got a little bit of adventure, I guess. Right. It, it's almost, like, it's weirdly evocative to me of, and this might just be proximity. It is almost definitely just proximity, but, like, Andre Balkonsky in uh, War and Peace looking at you know, a tree in the forest. And just because he's already gone through a rough day, he like sees this tree and it's withered and gnarled. And he's like, Oh my God, I'm 30 years old. I'm basically dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like this moment of looking out in nature and then seeing it not, you know, for what it is, but seeing like an internal state reflected outward. In this case, as you pointed out up to this point, he's shown no sign of really much of much creativity in the interior, but suddenly he does whatever that means. I don't know if that's, a valid way of looking at it but that's as you say that that's what what it calls to mind for me mm -hmm. yeah i i don't know there's also a case to be made that the story is mostly told through a limited perspective of viola i think too and so to see him from that materialist perspective is to see him also through her eyes uh in a way that she can't really penetrate like his his soul or write some sort of like internal aspect to him Right. But I don't know. I feel like I could be reading into it too much. Yeah, I oh, I feel like there's a lot to read into here. Or maybe it's more straightforward than we both think and uh <laughs> who knows. But I mean it's yeah, it could be. it's an enjoyable read either way. I like trying to tease it apart what we're what mm -hmm. we're saying here. I mean I think maybe to some point some of the ambiguity itself is is, is the interest. I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a definitive way to come down on how to how to uh, treat this. Um so maybe the fact that, you know, how, sort of maybe we've dealt with some of this fear of whatever this is, whatever has happened, the cat has brought them through this uh, to this moment. But still, I mean, the ending is very uncertain. Listen, there's one thing that I've learned from this. It's you cannot trust cats. <laughs> you can't. What, the cat saves Viola. I think you can only trust cats. Can't trust a cat. <laughs> That could be my personal trauma bleeding through into this reading, but sure. I don't know. Sure, sure, sure. Fair enough. Well, you know, speaking of ambiguity, you know, from 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 a cat person to a non cat person, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe you know, is is the black cat a rescuer or is the black cat a sign of uh, witchcraft? Who knows? 
Did the cat summon it? Is this a cat actually Behemoth of uh, <laughs> Master and Margarita? That is for you, dear listener, to decide. That's <laughs> um, a little a little tease forward. Um, this is what we call in, in the biz, in the news biz, uh, uh, um, selling it forward. Not selling it forward, just forward selling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good uh yeah i mean yeah i don't know and i'm looking at this i i just see so many other i don't know literatures reflected in it maybe because i am trying to like understand this that uh, you know what my mind is doing is searching for reference points like her whole Mm -hmm. um the whole dream or whatever we want to call it it's like very strongly evocative i don't have you ever listened to the um to the uh what is it it's i think it's the symphony the symphony fantastique by berlioz no symphony fantastique is and this is a little bit reading between the lines but this guy i think 18th century maybe 19th century who who's at a party and he sees this woman and she's so beautiful he falls in love immediately and i think he gets rebuffed or maybe he just never even tries and he goes home and he shoots up a bunch of heroin or some other drug maybe opium at the time uh and he effectively ods what, what he does is he does some kind of drug and then he sees a witch's dance called the dance macabre in the in the symphony of like all these shades gather around this sort of um, unusual music being played. Um, and uh, I mean, the conductor, the, the writer, I forget what exactly called someone who writes a symphony, uh, didn't really have a frame of reference for what ODing is. But I mean, taking a bunch of drugs and hallucinating like that, if it's a... Uh... Anyway, that aside, uh, like that's what it called to mind for me is like it had very strongly evocative of the show notes and how it describes the dance macabre. And I think part of that is, like I've said, just me trying to find reference points here for um for understanding like what's going on here but uh, it's enjoyable it's enjoyable you should read it you should pick up the anthology you should look at the anthology a lot of it's free online so mm-hmm. and again you can find links to the, the website for more information some of the uh the poetry that matt's mentioned some of the pieces on their website in the show notes do it or else the cat's <laughs> coming for you <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean unless there's anything else you think we should address i think i feel like that, that about covers it i'd say so all right well uh matt before we totally wrap up i have to ask what are we uh, what are we covering next week next episode we're going to be covering a movie our first in quite a while but we're excited to to steer into the the film avenue just a little bit mm. we're going to be covering leviathan the 2014 film by andres Vyagensev. And if you like uh, bleak depictions of life in the country, boy, do we have something for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, Matt, I'll link this in the show notes. Matt went on another podcast not too long ago, a couple months back, to talk about Leviathan. Yes. Um, yeah, and not to drag your feet over the coals here, but I think you saw Leviathan not too, for the first time before you did that podcast. Yes, I did. Uh, which I'm <laughs> astounded you made it this far in, like, I know. in the Slavic I studies know. without ever seeing Leviathan. I'm like, I know. Not, even, not even like trying to say like, oh, I, you know, did I had to watch that film at least three times in various classes I took. <laughs> so I just, so I'm, what, I, what I mean to convey is I just simply have no idea how you, <laughs> how you yeah. were never in a class. Maybe that's just like a Davis thing that those teachers just have obsessed with leviathan i don't know i see it's really hard when you study film to have not seen certain films yeah and it's hard to convey to people that i only really watch early 1920s silent film <laughs> and that's pretty much it right so yeah but no i did i was on watch list tonight with dan benamore which is a really great time and i had so so many notes that i wasn't able to cover that i thought mm-hmm. i need to get this out somewhere Thankfully, I have my own podcast, so I have a, uh, I got some, I got some deep cuts of reference that I wanted to get a little bit more into on here. All right, I'm excited for this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's gonna be good. To help keep our show independent and for exclusive access to notes containing all the research that went into this episode, head on over to our website, SlavicLitPod.com. Before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current supporters: Daniel, Lou, Gary, Janice, and Isaac. Emily, Caitlin, Yitza, Edini, and Pack Rob. The music used in this episode was Staraya Kino by Perit Motka. You can find more of their stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify. The links and spelling are in the show notes. You'll hear from us again soon. Bye.